Hi folks, my name is Johnny. Welcome to The Oddest. We all hear or read stories that are so crazy and mysterious that it's hard to believe they are actually true. In today's video, we're going to check out two of these stories. So sit back, relax and get ready for two of the oddest stories you will not believe are true. Let's take a short trip over to France. The place, a wee village in the north of France called Marquois. But we're going to skip back to the 28th of September in 1918. The First World War was still going on and in fact this story takes place only two months before the war ended. Henry James Tandy was a British soldier stationed in France at the time. He was part of the 5th Battalion of the Duke of Wellington's riding unit. Dug deep into the trenches there. Tandy was looking out across the plain open field towards where he knew German forces had been sighted. However, thanks to the early morning fog, visibility was limited to a certain distance. To Tandy's amazement, an unknown figure emerged from the mist and was walking straight towards the trench and Tandy was looking right at him. The figure ambled aimlessly towards him. He had his hands by his side and he certainly didn't seem to be carrying any weapon. Unsure if this could have been uh, an injured British soldier finding his way back to safety, Tandy did not fire at the man, though he kept his rifle aiming at the silhouetted figure. As the man stumbled closer to Tandy, it was apparent that the soldier was injured. Tandy silently watched as the man continued in a straight line towards him. At a moment's notice, if Tandy identified him as friendly, they would be ready to receive the injured ally. However, once the man was 50 yards or so away, Tandy could see that he was in fact not an ally, but a German soldier. Tandy did not fire upon the unarmed man. Instead, he just watched as the man's gaze remained downwards and his shoulders were slumped. Tandy postured upright and took aim at the soldier's chest. This time, however, the enemy soldier looked up and straight at Tandy. At that moment, he knew he had made a mistake and had wandered into enemy territory. Accepting his fate, the German soldier stopped walking and simply looked directly at Tandy, waiting for the bullet to strike. But the bullet wouldn't come. Tandy took stock of the situation and cautiously looked to his left and looked to his right to make sure that others were still asleep or being busy in other parts of the trench. Tandy lowered his rifle and maintained eye contact with the enemy soldier. As the German's eyes widened, he gave a gentle nod to Tandy, who in turn nodded back. The soldier then turned round and walked back into the fog. By the graces of God, he was spared from certain death by a merciful British soldier. That German soldier would later go on to say, that man came so near to killing me, that I thought I should never see Germany again. Providence saved me from such devilishly accurate fire as those English boys were aiming at us. That German soldier was Adolf Hitler. Back in 2005, 57-year-old Stephen Slevin was in reasonably good physical shape compared to that of his mental state. Stephen had a history of mental illness, and as such, one day he simply took off on a wee road trip. He was suffering from depression, and on August of that year, he simply decided to aimlessly drive and see where the road took him. One way Stephen would deal with his depression would be alcohol abuse. As such, one day whilst driving intoxicated, he was pulled over by police in New Mexico and was subsequently arrested for driving whilst intoxicated, or DWI for short. During the booking process at a nearby detention centre, the officers discovered on Stephen's file that he had a history of mental illness, and due to state policies, he was segregated from the general population and placed into solitary confinement. This was for his own safety and for the safety of the others. Throughout this story, I want you to always keep in mind that he was arrested for drunk driving. Not murder, or not any other crime considered more serious. He was steaming drunk and driving a car. Yes, that's bad. But let's keep some perspective here. The cell he was placed in was padded to prevent injury or harm. As well as that, he was adorned with a fashionable suicide smock. 
This is not like a straight jacket or that, although it does have a similar objective. This would give the wearer the freedom to move around and use their hands, all the while preventing them from injuring the body or balling up clothing. After a few days spent in the padded room, Stephen was moved to another cell, a better cell in many regards. This one had a wee window, space to shower, a sink and a toilet. Stephen was meant to be there to await confirmation of his court date so he could answer to the charges of driving while drunk. But two weeks after being in this cell, they would remove him yet again, only this time, to place him into solitary confinement. The reasons for this move has never been made clear or made public. Solitary confinement, as the name suggests, means you're alone in the tiniest room possible with little to no interaction with the outside world. The only human interaction Stephen would get would be when the prison guards brought him his food each day. Experts say that being left in solitary confinement for 15 days is enough to cause psychological damage and extended periods of time can even cause psychosis. So in a nutshell, many, many inmates have lost their minds from long stints in solitary confinement. Stephen's first few weeks in solitary though were actually okay. He was given writing materials and he was able to write to his family. He was glad to be off the hooch to be honest and he was able to detox. It was noted that Stephen was very polite with the staff when they were bringing his meals to him and if he needed any sort of medical attention he would calmly knock on the inside of the cell door and await a response, all the while remaining calm. However, by January 2006 it had been three months in this tiny solitary cell and still Stephen had no word about his court date. He was starting to feel like the system had just forgotten about him. Pretty soon Stephen started having panic attacks and slowly losing his grip on reality. He only wanted to find out how much longer he would be kept there but the system refused to tell him any information, often just fobbing him off. He was allowed outside of his cell for some fresh air only a few times per month but come April of 2006, that all stopped, for some reason. He had now been in solitary for nine months. Soon, this began taking a physical toll on Stephen. He began to exhibit welts on his body and develop fungal infections. His teeth would also begin to rot. Finally though, on the 8th of May 2007, yeah, you heard me right, 2007, so one year and eight months being held in solitary confinement, Stephen was transferred to a behavioural institute in Las Vegas, Nevada. After a few days having been able to eat properly, shower, get a haircut, he pretty much was able to bounce back to his former self. During this time, Stephen was able to sit down and talk to a lawyer. The lawyer would say that Stephen just kept asking him, where have I been? Stephen didn't know or have any memory of where he had been. The lawyer explained to him that he spent almost two years in solitary confinement in New Mexico whilst he was awaiting trial for his drink driving charge. But Stephen couldn't or wouldn't believe him. He had a hard time accepting this fact. He had been through so much psychological trauma that he had blocked out the past two years of his life. Eventually, during the conversation, his memories began to surface and through tears, Stephen would beg the lawyer not to let them send him back to that place, not back to solitary. His lawyer would simply tell him to remain strong, stay positive, and of course he would have to remain incarcerated until his court date. Unfortunately, no one, including his lawyer, could tell him when that would be. Stephen remained at the institute for a further two weeks. During that time, he would continually be asking about his court case and trial date, to which he was told, no one knows. After these two weeks, Stephen was taken back to New Mexico and back into the solitary cell that he had come from. Despite his pleas not to be put back into solitary, he'd say, just put me anywhere else, but please, not back into solitary. But nope, no one was listening. And before long, the cell door was shut and Stephen was back. Almost immediately he regressed right back to psychological distress. He had developed an abscess under one of his teeth and although desperate for medical attention, this was refused. For eight hours one day, he simply sat rocking back and forth whilst trying to pull this tooth free from his skull. Eventually he ripped the tooth out of his own head. Two months later, on the 22nd of June 2007, Stephen was finally put in front of a judge to address this case. What happened, you may ask? Ah, all charges dismissed. Stephen was immediately released from custody and was reunited with his family. 
Stephen spent two years in solitary confinement without one hearing or one court appearance. He was simply forgotten about. Stephen would go on to sue the county and was awarded $15.5 million. However, in a twist of fate, as he was celebrating winning this case, he was diagnosed with terminal lung cancer, which he would pass away from. Why they did what they did, I have no idea. Well folks, that's it for another wee video. See if you've enjoyed this or any of my other videos, please take a wee moment to hit the like button. Better yet, nudge that subscribe button also and whilst you're down there, leave me a wee comment. I will always reply. Stay safe and keep smiling.